Robert, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Where do we find you today, Bob? Uh, I'm in um, Pennsylvania, home, in Milford, Pennsylvania. You grew up in London, right? I grew up in London. Yeah, I was born in New York City. Yeah. But we moved to London when I was about two, two and a half. And so I grew up English. I thought I was English. <laughs> <It's cold laughs> I wasn't. When we came back to America in 1971. And a couple of years later, I was due to go into the draft of Vietnam. And well, so hello. I, realized I really was American. You know, I knew it. I sort of <laughs> objectively knew I was American. But when the uh, draft time came around, there was no denying it. But they ended it a month before I turned 18. I had a similar story. I was in college. And so you had a college deferment. And the uh, uh, president at the time, Nixon, announced that they were, uh, they, they'd call them in uh, blocks of five numbers. Mm -hmm. So it was one through 365. And I think my number was 170, uh, 171. And uh, they'd call them in blocks of five, usually two blocks at a time. So 10 numbers at a time. And in the springtime, he said, I don't think we'll get up over 50 this year. And uh, I remember in November when he called, 160 and 165, ending at 169, and I think I was 171. Oh, I wow. uh, I didn't sleep well for the next month until the calendar passed, and they didn't make any more calls for that year because I had so smart that I believed them when he said they wouldn't go past 50, and I gave up my college deferment. So there I was saying, yeah, thinking, well, next stop Vietnam, but uh, yeah. it never happened. Yeah, yeah no, you both got lucky. Exactly. Yes. I never had to make the choice. I never was. I, there was a classmate of mine who um, was a bit older. He was, in the, he was in the draft several months before I was. And he um, was, we were all sitting around. And it was the same thing. We heard after 50, nobody gets called. He was number one. It was the first number. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I punctured that little balloon of, of hope. <laughs> so uh, growing up in London, how do you think that was different than, uh, than your friends who grew up here in the States, particularly in New York? Well, I grew up in London in the post-war. You know, I grew up in London late 50s through 70, 71. Which is not the London we know today. Oh, absolutely not. It was a very, very different London. Very drab, very black and white very decimated still, 10, 20, even 20 years after the war ended, London still had a number of um, what we call bomb sites, just areas yes. completely devastated, just rubble. But in 1959, 60, it was still very much post-war, you know, and, and the war dominated English life and conversation and references. I can't imagine that it wouldn't. Yeah, no, I grew up with it very much of a, you know, a, a, a present phenomenon. You know, it was post-war, but it was very, very live, very, very real. Yes. And everybody, every adult had been in it, either survived it or uh, by living in London or else in the country or, or had fought in it. Um, so it was a very different London, um, not at all cosmopolitan, um, very much a recovering city, very poor incredibly poor um, because it was devastated by the war. Uh, and it was not until really the mid to late 60s when the swinging 60s hit that London suddenly became Technicolor. And uh, mm. that was a fabulous thing to see. I was too young to, to experience it or be involved in it, but I was um, just old enough to be aware of it. So Piccadilly, uh, the color revolution of the uh, music of the times. Now, someone who yeah. understands yeah. music like you, you do, I would imagine that the uh, the music scene in the early 60s that gave us uh, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, of course, uh, but so many other exports to the world popular cultural scene had a huge influence on the attitude and culture and color of London. Oh, absolutely. Again, put it in context, we're coming out of, we were coming out of such drabness, such shabbiness in every walk of life. The, the buses and the cars and the streets were gray and dark and, you know, old and dilapidated and, you know, but there was a wonderful, fantastic spirit, like the ionization of the air post the survival and triumph of the war. So there was that. And London was a fantastic place to grow up. It was um, safe. Uh, it was communal, you know, you, you had class system very much in place then, but, but people were not, you know, segregated. Um, and there was a wonderful spirit. And of course, as I grew from my 
single digits into my early teens, London became this center of the world, musically, culturally, fashion-wise. And, and a lot of people don't uh, give true props to the invention of the pill, which of course started the sexual revolution. And, you know, England- Good, good point. Yeah, and England really uh, was the center of that too. And all the great American rock and rollers came to England because that was where it was happening. So you had this fantastic fusion of, of spirits and creativity. I think London in the 60s was like Paris is said to have been in the 20s. So the next generation came along. They didn't have the emotional scars and, and vivid memories of the war. And mm -hmm. we have to remember, of course, that uh, London was under constant bombing mm -hmm. and uh, many, many casualties. What would you point to as the the spark that, that, be, that I think that the pill is an interesting observation, but mm -hmm. what else from a musical point of view, maybe uh, was the spark to say, Hey, let's kick off this, this gray way, this gray attitude. Uh, let's think in technicolor. Any, anything you'd point to? Uh, a few. I mean, the Beatles are obvious, yep. but for London, it would be the Rolling Stones because they were working class Londoners who had all experienced the war. They were all, alive during the war. Sure. Um, they were too young to fight in it, but they were alive in it. And they represented this entire new generation that was just setting their own rules. I mean, even, even the length of hair worn by musicians in those days was a controversy. It was on the news at night. It was looked down upon. You were outcasts in society. And if my hair grew a quarter of an inch too long, I was scolded. tops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, but the Beatles and the Stones and the Kinks and all the rest, they could get away with it. So you had this fantastic outlaw spirit. So I, I think it's the Stones and the Who, another London-based group that, that sort of just broke everything down. And then you had people like Tom Jones, who was not quite rock and roll, but he was a big pop star. And he was a sexy guy. And, you know, he was Engelbert big, Humperdinck. You know, and it was a sexual revolution. And it, all of a sudden, London was the place. And you had the, the Chelsea drugstore. And you had, you know, King's Road and fashion and that that was it. it. It happened almost overnight, in my recollection. Really, that's amazing. It was foggy at this point. <laughs> now you're, you're you're 18 or so, and all of a sudden, you're a you're an entrepreneur. You're a publisher. Mm -hmm. Tell us how that mm -hmm. happened. Well, I um had moved back to the states at the age of 15, and went to high school in New Jersey. My family was split. My mother and father were split, but they wanted to stay close. So we were in New Jersey, my father lived in New York and had his, his business, Penthouse Magazine. So um, I didn't actually finish high school, I actually failed high school. Uh, there's a reason for that. Partly I was a distracted kid, bored, but also my mother was very ill and I ran the family. You know, I looked after the family from about 15 till 17 and I fled at 17. Um, but everybody was okay by then. My mother was better, the kids were under her care and, you know, getting older too. So. That contributed to my not doing very well at school by virtue of never going. <laughs> you know, I apparently set the state truancy record, which I was <laughs> proud of because I remember it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I, I just fled to London and, you know, but I knew London. I missed London, London, my culture, yep. my heritage. And I had this girlfriend who had said to me, I'd met her earlier on a summer trip to London. And she said, you ever want to come to London, stay with me. So she meant for the weekend. I thought she meant for life. <laughs> so I turned up with my luggage. <laughs> and she sort of disabused me of that notion after three days. I said, no, no, this, this is nice, but you don't get to live here. So I was literally homeless <laughs> in London for about uh, six, seven months. And um, during that time, I had befriended a guy. And he correctly said, you know, the Kung Fu craze is so big right now. Why don't we put out a Kung Fu magazine? I said, that's not like a great idea. I'm sure I know how to do it. I was 18. <laughs> and we, we did actually publish the thing. It was a big success uh, called A Step-by-Step -step Guide to Kung Fu. And it was a teach yourself Kung Fu in, in God knows, 400 something moves. There were so many different moves. And the night before we went to press, having finally put everything together, we said, or I said, I think, you know, do we know if this stuff actually works? I mean, as we've described it. <laughs> so we went through every single chokehold, kick and punch until five in the morning, just to see if it worked. And there were a couple we couldn't work out. The guy who we were dealing with, the expert, the kind of expert, had described something beyond our ken. So I finally said, look, if we can't work it out, now we're going to work it out, how would it let it go? <laughs> so that, that was 99% well fact-checked. There are two or three moves in there that are probably lethal. We have no idea. 
That was and your it, first foray into publishing, and it was successful. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, it was very, very, um, well, well, it's the word, belying, because the rest of the publishing has been very hard. <laughs> but the first <laughs> one was a hit. <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's the problem. The first one's easy, and now you're hooked. And yeah, then you find exactly. out hooked that was an aberration. <laughs> it's 49 years ago, you know? I'm still doing it. Wow. Uh, and, you know, as so I came back to the States, and I said, well, if I work this hard in London, where it's so hard to actually do anything. Because London's infrastructure wasn't great, and there's, a, there's an innate laziness in the British people. And I say that as somebody who's half, half English. Um, so I should give you some immunity to say this. But uh, there's a great laziness. <laughs> and so I said, let me go back to America, where I know everybody works really hard and succeeds fantastically. And, and, uh, it, and I started another magazine called Rock Superstars, which was actually my first most innocent foray into the music world. And that after two years, we just broke even. We, we did not make money. We, we had lost a lot of money, but we recouped it by selling off our inventory. And I learned a very valuable lesson then, which is, you know, this isn't easy. And you sometimes eat some humble pie because selling off the inventory is the only way to, to pay off our printers and, you know, contributors was, was, was uh, you know, humbling. The net benefits were it did get you uh, a, a brand awareness in the music world. It gave you a lot of contacts and relationships and you realize that that's where your passion was. Yes and no. Um, you're, you're partly right. My passion has always been for the written word. It's as a writer, and it's as an editor and a publisher. And the publisher role is important because that's where I get to support myself as an editor. You know, the folly and the problem with so many publications today is a very good editor has a story they believe in, but the publishing side says, oh, this might upset somebody, so we can't run it. We have to weaken it, we have to dilute it or kill it altogether. And after a while, the publishing side wins and most media becomes very diluted, very generic and very weak. So as the editor and publisher, and probably one of the last people to really assume that title, you know, because um, you don't see that anymore. Uh, and I, I held it in every print magazine I ever did. Um, I could make that business decision with the editorial validity and value in my mind. And so I did. But my passion has always been for, for the written word, for journalism, for reporting, for advocating, uh, for a good story, the truth. You know, all, the, all this sounds cliched, I know. But I am telling you, for 49 years, I dedicated my life to that principle uh, with good and bad results. I've been hurt and I've been successful. Um, and I've been hounded and, and, and disliked uh, and repudiated for a lot of my convictions. And, uh, but that was my passion. And music was a great passion in the same way it was for any young person in their 20s. You know, sure. we were into music. And what happened with the, uh, the, the you know, launch of Spin and the beginning of Spin was that it was the, the merging of two great passions, one for the new music that was not getting media coverage at the time, um, but which I and my friends were all listening to, and more importantly, all our girlfriends were listening to. So <laughs> we, uh, we had this musical thing. The, we called it underground music in those days. And we had this great, uh, you know, sort of powerful, potent stream of new music that only we knew about. We used to share cassettes to turn people onto new groups and new songs. Sure. And I thought, wait a minute, why don't I start a magazine for this generation and this musical stream, the same way that Rolling Stone in the late 60s started a magazine for rock and roll and, and that yep. undisturbed audience. So we, we, we were, you know, a new evolution in that. And, you know, um, you know I, I at the time thought Rolling Stone, nearly 17 years old, how old? <laughs> <You know, laughs> Today's spin is 38 years old, but I did bring those two confluences together, you know, a passion for the new music and the, and the, the knowledge or the, or the expectation or the, or the confidence that there was an audience willing to, you know, buy a magazine that talked about things they weren't reading about anywhere else. One thing I remember you did that always stuck out in my mind is back in Sarajevo, mm. right after the Peace Accord, you did a you promoted a concert featuring yeah. you two. Yeah. Where everybody who had been at war a month before came together for an outdoor concert. That must right. have been amazing. How did it come about? Where did the idea come from? And uh, and what role do you story. think that played in the world? 
Well, I imagine the role it played in the world was a very small one, you know, honestly, but it was, it was a significant symbol of peace and, you know, coming together, different peoples coming together. Um, what happened was right at the end of the war, at the end of uh, 93, I believe, um, I met Bono from U2 in, in, in Jamaica, got talking, and at breakfast the next day, he said, why don't you uh, go to, why doesn't Spin cover Sarajevo? I said, well, we've covered the wars in the Balkans three times already, including sending the Nirvana bassist, uh, Chris Novoselic, to Croatia. That's another great story unto itself, if you like. I, I <laughs> but, bet. <laughs> but, uh, 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 but in talking about it, I said, you know what? We should do a post-war story, because we knew the Dayton Accord had been signed. Now, the people in Bosnia weren't so sure it was a peace. You know, they'd had false pieces before, false, false ceasefires, and then gotten slaughtered. Sure. So it was still a hot war zone, is what I'm saying. So in February of that year, February 2nd, I think it was a very early uh, February, went off to uh, Sarajevo. Uh, my friend and photographer, Lauren Haynes, in tow, very unsure that he should have been going, very, very not so sure it was a good idea to follow me. In, in the, you say, uh, look, we're friends, but we're New York friends. <laughs> yeah, we're New York friends. Can we do a fashion shoot, he said? <laughs> So anyway, off we go. And uh, I did a, a story for Spin based on my experience. And I had a fantastic time meeting the kids who had survived. And my, my story focused on those kids who had survived the siege. Some of them had been soldiers and killed many people. Many of them had just witnessed many deaths and lost a lot of loved ones. So the city was still under siege. And I called this piece Life After Death um, because that's exactly what it was, the, the life of people returning to some form of normality. And when I came back, I befriended the Bosnian ambassador to the UN uh, through an introduction by Bono. And we had lunch a few times and he said, let's have a party, let's have a party at the UN. You bring rock and rollers, I'll bring ambassadors. I said, oh, that sounded like a great idea at the time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> no logic to it whatsoever. So we have this massive great party in what is their cafeteria, which is the size of an airport hangar. I mean, it's a big uh -huh. old cafeteria, you know? And there's one ambassador after another giving a fantastic, articulate, powerful speech about the state of the world. And then finally, I, I had to get up and talk. And I wasn't really prepared to follow that group. I knew I'd have, to have some remarks. But so I get up there and I noticed that it was a year to the day that I was in Sarajevo. And it was the end of um, the month of fasting. So... NATO had allowed, uh, had suspended the uh, curfew and allowed people to stay out late. And so I was with a bunch of Bosnians and we stole a UN van and we drove from party to party all night. <laughs> the famous thing I ever did was be in the back of that van because the guy driving it couldn't drive stick. <laughs> and so he nearly killed him four or five times. Nothing Rocky else ride. Close. Nothing else came close to mortality but driving in that van that night. Anyway, so I said, <laughs> I said to the uh, the audience at the UN, I said, but don't worry, we gave it back, but you have no security, FYI. I mean, everybody's taking these vans like like we take city bikes now. And yep. so uh, everybody laughed. And I said, but I said, we're going to put on a concert. And I ad libbed this. We're going to put on a concert in Sarajevo so that all of the people who are um, around the world who read about but didn't quite understand the plight of the people suffering the siege, suffering this war, um, will actually it, metaphorically be standing next to them at a concert. And they will never again let this kind of thing happen and pass un, unnoticed and un, unresisted. Oh, tremendous you know, amount of applause for this. So as I come down off the um, little stage, Mo, the Bosnian ambassador says, we're putting on a concert? I said, we are now. <laughs> <laughs> we had lunch the next day and we worked it out, which was, our version was we call you two. <laughs> uh -huh. So I called them and they originally said no. The manager said no, it's not for us. Blah, blah, blah. No, we don't want to be attached to that. We've done our thing with Bosnia, blah, blah, blah. Oh, fine, forgot about it. Um, and several months later, I think maybe six months, I get a phone call from that same manager saying, is it still possible to do it? The boys now think it's a good idea. It's good for them to do it and they want to do it. I said, well, I can put it together. So I call Mo, well, off we go to Sarajevo. It's July, it's hot. It's, what an adventure. It was. And um, we spent a very surreal afternoon, July 4th, very surreal uh, celebration at the Bosnian ambassador. I mean, the um, American ambassador of Bosnia in his, in his back garden. Um, and 
we tried to put together a concert, which we realized pretty quickly we couldn't do. We had no idea how to do this properly. And I said to Mo, I said, this is really a bad thing because we're going to be bringing together Serbs, Croats, Bosnians, possibly Macedonians, and we're going to be putting them in a soccer stadium, an open stadium, and, and two, you know, several months ago, they were all trying to kill each other, and they're going to murder each other. It's terrible. We're going to be the result of our playing around here is that we're going to get people killed. I said, we've got to think of another plan. And he said, what should we do? And I said, we tell Bono, we don't know how to do this. We panic him. And he immediately sends his experts in to do the concert. And that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great success. <laughs> but the, the last part of that story is that, so Mo and I still sit in this area and he knew all the gangsters because he had been the foreign minister for Bosnia during the war and had gone in and out of the uh, black market tunnels, the smuggling sure. tunnels under the city. So he knew all the gangsters. And I said, well, look, you too is not going to have uh, any advantage over us in picking security because they don't know anybody here. But you know all the gangsters. Let's go pick the best of the gangsters to do the security because everybody <laughs> will respect them. And that's what we did. Rolling um, Stones tried that uh, with, a, with a motorcycle club. Yeah, that didn't work. That didn't not work. Not so good. I, I had that in the back of my mind at the time. But it was such a different thing because this was a small – Sarajevo is a very small city and an even smaller community. You know, everybody yeah. knew everybody. So you knew the gangsters. You knew not to mess with them. They were they they had no agenda just to get paid and to look yeah. after them. And everybody was there to have a good time. And if there were any incidences, they would have they would have controlled it. So it wasn't quite the same as having the Hell's Angels come. When you think about the genius of doing it with uh, you two, uh, was they were the perfect band for the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, their music, their brand uh, essence. Uh, the things that they held out as important to them, and of course, coming from Ireland, uh, where they had just uh, just about to get over the troubles. Right. So it was, a, it was like a, a, a genius uh, stroke that uh, that that was the perfect band to make that happen. Well, well, thank you for that. That but I got to be honest; it was also really the most obvious choice because a Bono had introduced Mohammed Shaka and me. To each other, uh -huh. and B, you two had done uh, nightly live hookups from Sarajevo on their their tour across Europe, um, put together by a guy called Bill Carter, who was the guy who got me into Sarajevo, set me up with all the contacts. So it was very circuitous, and they were the most obvious band, and they were heroes in yep. Bosnia, total heroes because they kept the war in front of people um, nightly, um, yep. and so. And to their great credit, they did a great show and they, you know, they really put effort into it. They lost a lot of money. There was no money. It was a free concert. So they brought their entire show. They didn't just turn up with their guitars and play. They brought their entire, you know, production. It was the Pop Mart tour, I think. And, um, and, that's, a, and that's a big deal. Oh, it was, it was massive. I mean, it was, uh, mm. it was logistically like an army moving in. So mm. to their credit, they did a great job and the city came to see them. And, but um, yep. But it was funny, it just came out of an ad libbing in the middle of his beach. <laughs> but it was a great concert. It really did. I didn't, you know, I maybe underestimated it. I'd said it didn't make much of a difference. It, at the time, it made a huge difference because I think it showed the people of the former Yugoslavia that they really could stand next to each other and, uh, and enjoy something and not hate each other. Music has always been a, a recurring theme in your life. And that you, you mentioned uh, 37 years of spin. You're back working with spin now, aren't you? Yeah, I'm consulting him actually. Yeah, it was just yeah. great fun and a um, very weird experience. You know, it's like being uh, uh, the, the parent of a child being asked to come in and babysit the child <laughs> for the new parents. <laughs> <laughs> so, you enjoying that? Yeah, very much. Very, very much. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's great. It's very, well, they're a great bunch. And the owner is a very open minded guy who obviously has a very balanced ego to ask the founder to come in and uh, yeah, I'd say. Yeah. yeah so, quite but remarkable. I'm very respectful of him too. And I understand it's his company and at the end of the day, it's his decisions. I give him what I think. And, you know, he, he can take or not take as he wishes the advice. But uh, you've also developed a passion for travel and not just, not just travel, but special kinds of travel. Uh, you have a company now called Wanderlust. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us, what is Wanderlust? How did your interest develop here over time? And and what is it today? What would you like it to be? Oh, great questions. A lot of them do. Um, well, the idea for Wanderlust came to me as I was sort of evolving 
my own interests. Uh, uh, you know, my 60s, I was less interested in pop culture um, and pop culture was less relevant to me. So even though I consult spin, I don't, uh, you know, pretend to be au courant with the music scene. I I'm giving a more over overview guidance to what makes a great story and, and how do you make a great site and how do you reach and appeal to your audience. That's a different thing than picking the next big band. But so pop culture wasn't as relevant to me. I'd done that. I, I always say that, you know, I had the answers to the questions the artists were asking. So therefore there wasn't that spontaneity anymore, that it's spontaneous energy for me anymore. But travel has always been a great passion, equal passion in music by far, um, greater than the other passion I have. So I thought, well, why don't I do with travel something similar to what I did with everything else I've ever done, including the science magazine I owned once, um, which is give it a sense of humor, sense of irreverence, and go into it completely open-eyed. And the difference between Wonderlust and the other travel publications, besides the fact they're bigger, but we're younger, but the real difference is, I think they set themselves up as being experts. You know, we know everything, we're gonna tell you, we're gonna throw you morsels over the parapet. And my thing is, there is no war, we don't know everything. Yep. We, we, we go places and we come back with information, which we'll gladly share with you completely and utterly. You can take it, take it from us. And we hope you enjoy it. That's a completely different thing. And the other thing is too, I said earlier that we have a sense of humor. Wonderlust is a sense of humor. Well, whoever reads a, a, a travel article and laughs, you do with us because we have a sense of humor. Now, the, I wondered after a while, I thought, well, why are we the only ones who think that humor is important in travel reporting? Why does everyone else take it so seriously? Um, and I realized that with humor, you break down all the barriers. Everybody's equal. If you laugh with someone, you go, okay, if you're the king of England and you're a taxi driver, you laugh together, you are equal in that moment. It is the great barrier destroyer. You cannot be greater than somebody if you're laughing with them. I like the so, fact that everything you've done has a, that common uh, twist to it, which is a irreverence, a real lust for uh, honesty and uh, and always with a sense of humor. And that's you. that's permeated everything you've done. And so, now to see you apply that in the travel world, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, no, it's fun. It's um, it can be a simple attitude. It can be a simple turn of phrase. The key, I think, is we don't take ourselves too seriously. George mm -hmm. Bernard Shaw had a great line. He said, take you take your job seriously yourself. Never. And yep. we follow that and we don't take it so seriously. And I have to say, with due respect to many of my friends and peers in the rest of the travel business, too many of them do take themselves too seriously. And, you know, it's just, you can't relate to that. By the way, if you can make somebody laugh, they can relate to you. They follow it, 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 you, they trust you, you know? Um, they warm up to you. They feel like they know you. So that's our spirit. We it's, it's, you called it before, it's the equalizer. It, yeah. it's, it, it level sets everything. It's a part of my repertoire. It's how I try and get to know people quickly, as particularly when I first meet people, a little surprise humor. It, mm -hmm. it helps get you into a to a, a platform of a potential relationship much more quickly. Absolutely. And it's a um a sign of obviously it's a sign of intelligence, but it's also a sign of some sort of emotional connectivity, chemistry. The other thing about laughter, I was in um, St. Martin once years ago, actually before Wonderlust. And it was there with my girlfriend, my current girlfriend. And um, we were in the pool and it was the time between breakfast and lunch. So all of the people who worked there were quietly sitting on the terrace, having a coffee together. And they were laughing. And I said, listen to that, to Elijah. I said, listen to that. That's the universal sound of safety. It's, a, it's safe to laugh mm -hmm. together. And it's a signal that there's no danger. So I had been thinking about why don't other magazines have, and publications and sites have more humor in what they do in the travel space. And I thought it's because they do create this, this illusion that they have more answers. You better stay close to them and wait for the morsels to fall off the table. Um, the other thing I couldn't stand about a lot of travel media was this, them telling us how much fun they're having. How do I relate to that? <laughs> What do I get? <laughs> Tell me how I can have fun. That's what I want. <laughs> but but you don't look at just regular travel. No. Like, like everything else, you got a twist to it. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, first of all, we do have fun with the form. You know, we uh, did very early on a very big article for us called The World's Worst Features. And I said to my editors, I said, I will not allow you ever to produce a list of the world's best features. That's nonsense. Every beach is a good beach, almost every beach is a good beach. Um, it's ridiculous. You could, you could do 100 great beaches in America alone and they'd be as good as anything in 100 in the Mediterranean. I mean, so that's, that's silly. But I want to know where the worst beaches are. The beaches are just so foul, so bad, you will die if you go. And we found the <laughs> list. It's genius. It's, a brilliant list. it's everything from nuclear waste to so many... <laughs> So many needles from discarded heroin users that you will stab yourself on the, you, as you walk on the beach to the shark attack capital of the world, Somalia beaches because they have pirates. And so it was a great piece and it's funny, but it's also a great sort of antidote to an industry taking itself too seriously. Your target audience quite affluent, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It's, um, it's actually a lot of boomers, uh, RH and um, uh -huh. uh, Gen X. So we, we don't, which is great because I'm not interested in, 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 in following the shadows of, you know, Gen Z. They, they view travel differently. There was a study came out recently, but I knew this anyway, uh, intuitively. It's been like 80% of Gen Z, 80 out of 100 travelers in that age group travel so they can get a good Instagram photograph. So I think, <laughs> I think maybe the wrong priority. The notion that you were there is only only certified by the fact you have an Instagram picture. I, I, I think that's wrong. I think you go to a place to be absorbed by the place, not, not to absorb it, but to be absorbed by it. The attitude doesn't become, it drifts from, wow, that's beautiful, I'm here, let me absorb it, to forgetting about that you're here and understanding the experience and only be thinking about how can you populate your Instagram page or share them with uh, friends and uh, those photos with friends and family. It's a different experience. Oh, it's also a different ideology. You talked about boomers, uh, uh, Bob. Uh, boomer travel is that your focus on. They're affluent. They're looking for something a little different. Uh, you're, you're saying, okay, you might want to go uh, to this Caribbean island, but if you're in the Caribbean island, these are five things you might think of doing that you wouldn't have ordinarily thought of can, that can make that travel experience unique and special for you yes that's and and uh, and so it seems like that, that's a group that couldn't that can afford to travel has traveled a lot but is looking to change the experience and make it much more tailored to, to them experiential yes yeah and that's not all we do but that's a big part of what we do mm -hmm. um, and a big part of everything we do is you know what does the reader want from this article you know, so sometimes you want one set of things because, I mean, you know, you go to, frankly, you go to Barcelona, you probably want to know where to eat because it's, you know, yes. you don't want to leave Barcelona without eating in the best places. Um, you don't need to be told it's beautiful and it's, you know, a certain kind of architecture. Um, and you might want to know where to stay. Well, we run the gauntlet. Sometimes we do pieces that you can't replicate. Um, there are experiences by people who are adventure travelers who are doing things that the majority of people cannot do. But this is fantastic mm -hmm. to read about. And then there are yes. just one of my favorite articles we ever did was I said to my editors one day, I said, where is the world's least visited museum? What museum gets least visited the museum? Yeah, what museum gets the least amount of people come to it? So we found it. It's Scott's Hut in Antarctica. Less than 100 well. people a year go there. And it costs $28,000 <laughs> to get there. And they but, love it. <laughs> they love it. They do love it. They do enjoy it. But this came to light particularly, it used to be less, it used to be less than a dozen people in there a year. But it came to light more after a little bit of global warming thawed out a lot of his hut. So a lot of the ice that was covering a lot of the artifacts melted. And these artifacts came to light. You know, if you didn't know they were there. Uh, so huh. that, that did, that spurred an interest. Bob, let me ask you, a place that you've been to that you're looking forward to returning to, some place you haven't been to that you're looking forward to visiting? Oh, great, great questions. Well, let me answer the second one first. I really want to go to the empty quarter, the largest contiguous sand desert in the world. Mm -hmm. It's um, part of Yemen, Oman, Qatar, and, I, and I, I believe one other country, certainly those three. It's where, um, I forget his name now, Sir Wilfred, 
a great, great explorer. I've just forgotten his name, I blanked his name, but he wrote a wonderful book called Arabian Sands about life in the empty quarter. This was back in the 30s, 1930s. And he uh, brought to light this fantastic, you know, barren wasteland populated merely by nomadic um, tribes uh, that he had to cross a couple of times to get to where he was going, which was frankly in Ethiopia, but he had to cross this desert to get, no, it, wasn't, it came from Ethiopia. He was working for the American oil companies at the time. And mm -hmm. they um, were beset by all kinds of problems, one of which was locusts, believe it or not. So they couldn't build their plants because the locusts would come. So he wrote this fantastic book, Arabian Sands. It is the most inhospitable place on earth. But there are tour groups that will take you in for a couple of nights or three uh -huh. nights. And, you, and they will bring you to a nomadic tribe and you just get to experience something that is so unlike any other experience that I want to do that. The place I most want to return to is Italy. I've been there probably four dozen times. Yeah, definitely close to 50 times, if not 50. And there's a wonderful, fantastic restaurant, my favorite restaurant in the world, uh, at a um, converted convent slash monastery. It was started in 1212 by St. Francis. Uh, and it was taken over in the 70s, dilapidated, you know, falling down by a priest called Padre, Padre Eligio, who had started a drug rehabilitation center called Mondo X. He now has 12 of these around Italy. And, well, and, and what town is this in? It's in a town called Certona, not Cortona, Certona, uh -huh. uh, in Tuscany. Um, and it's the restaurant called La Frateria, but, but the, the um, place itself, is a drug rehab and it's called Il Convento di San Francisco. And it's a drug convent. It's not, the restaurant is not in a drug convent. It is the drug rehab center. And everybody who works there is a recovering addict. Um, and they have six rooms, guest rooms you can stay in. Most people uh, don't, they just go for the restaurant. But the restaurant is the best of every net anywhere in the world. And when I talk to great restaurateurs, Amazing. like Baloo or Danny, Maya, they go, oh, I know this place. Oh my God, I gotta go. I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And uh, it's just fantastic. But everybody in the kitchen, from the executive chef down to the runners, are recovering addicts. The incredible thing about this institution, Mondo X, is that the recidivism rate is low. Guess what the recidivism rate is? Twenty percent. One. One percent. No. One. No. Yep. That's Nine. remarkable. It is remarkable. And it's their theory. It's just that you work hard. You get up in the morning early, you tend the, the grounds, you, you, f you tend the fields, you grow the food, you collect the food, you make the food, you make the beds in the hotel rooms. You work, you know, selflessly for a day and you buy this. You have meaning, food. purpose, and relationships exactly. in your life. And you have a reflection on where you went wrong and you accept where you went wrong. And mm -hmm. uh, a tremendous place. I'll send you the article. I I'd love to see it. Yeah, it, we'll, have it to, is. we'll have to republish it in Worth. Oh, please, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. You that would mind. be wonderful. When you come to New York City, you you know so many of the great uh, uh, chefs of New York. Uh, the, my uh, my favorite line I stole from a friend of mine, in La Larry Zarin, is your favorite restaurant is the place where they know your name. But mm -hmm. when you when you come to town, what are two, three, four places you like to visit? So there are two favorite restaurants in terms of just gastronomical supremacy. One is Danielle. One of the great so my, wife, my wife and I have a significant anniversary coming up, and uh, I'll be making a reservation shortly. That's our, uh, that's our go-to special event place. If you need any help, let me know. Daniel's a friend of mine, so I can help. <laughs> he's, he's a wonderful guy. Yeah, he's a great guy. And um, the other is the modern. Danny oh, you like the modern? I, I think it's a really good experience. People don't realize it's a Danny Meyer restaurant. Yeah. But it's it's quite remarkable. It's fantastic. If you have the prefix meal, it's a spectacular gastronomical feast. If mm -hmm. you just eat off the regular menu, it's a fantastic gastronomical feast. <laughs> really good either way. Um, and I've taken my girlfriend there for our significant anniversary, actually. Uh, yep. And, and her birthday recently. 
the, but it's not a favorite restaurant. It's a very, very, very down to earth place called Queen of Sheba on 10th Avenue and 46th uh -huh. Ethiopian restaurant. It's it's our favorite restaurant in New York. Well, I'll we, have to give it a try. We're going there tomorrow night. It. Oh, it's, good for you. Our favorite place that we just feel very, very comfortable in. Know that whatever we take uh, order off the menu or specials are going to be fantastic. And it just feels so good because the staff is so good is uh, craft. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm a Tom Colicchio friend and fan, and it's really, really 20 years, and, and it keeps getting better. Well, you know, I've never been. I always wanted to go. I loved when he was uh, at um, Gramercy Tavern. Yeah, he started at Gramercy with Danny. Uh, and, uh, he was there for, I guess, the first six years, and then he moved over and created craft. And uh, it's on East 19th Street, and it just, it just, it checks all the boxes. Yeah, the, the staff is so well trained. The spirit is so good. It looks great as a restaurant. The menu is exciting and different and changes up all the time. It just is an all around great experience. Well, I'm gonna try it. I have not been. Let me throw a, a, a different topic at you. An important subject that I know that's important to you. It's been important to you in everything we hear from you today. And I, I, it's so uh, good to share your time with us, Bob. But oh, relationships, okay. relationships matter. They've been key to your life. I wonder what uh, growing up in a family where your dad was a publisher, how much that influenced your appreciation for the written word. Only your dad is not known for the typeface in his publication. Uh, but uh, what influence did that have on you? Relationships with your dad, with your mom. Uh, how did they influence your life? How important are relationships to you? Are they to you today? And are you deliberate about maintaining, developing? And exploring new relationships today. Wow, great question. That was all out right there, Jim. You say indeed. Time. So I give you, you know, four minutes. <laughs> okay, four minutes. Four minutes to sum up life. <laughs> indeed. Yes. First of all, to answer your last question, yes, I am very, very um, eager to have new relationships. Um, as one gets older, and I, I'm going to presume you feel the same way, one well, gets more discriminatory in how many relationships you keep keep going. You know, there's only so many plates you want to spin at a certain yes. age. Whereas when you're younger, you spin more and you look for more. Um, obviously, I'm in a very committed relationship, and that's the only, you know, man-woman relationship I'm in or want to be in. Um, yep. I'm very, very blessed. I've got a great woman who, you know, I always say she can she can kick my ass and and does. And that's very, <laughs> very, very key. And apparently you need it. I, apparently I do. I did not realize this. She has, <laughs> she has made me aware of that. <laughs> And, uh, you know, uh, that's that's just a great relationship. But I am interested in other relationships with men and women. You know, I, lo I love meeting new people. I love um, sparking new, stimulating, you know, relationships, activating new nerve endings in one's life. So, yes, I'm going back to your earlier set of questions about my father. He 100% influenced me. And just to correct you a little, he is not known for the, the written word, but Penthouse at the time in the 70s was publishing the most provocative writers and publishing the most um, powerful investigative reporting of any other publication. It even beat Playboy in terms of investigative reporting. The word provocative, your, your dad, to my recollection, was provocative in everything he did. Oh, absolutely. 100%. And by the way, terrible. you got that in you too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. Liza always says, when somebody says, so what's Bob all about? He's about pissing people off. Is what he is. <laughs> That's and making up. them laugh at the same time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, I hope she adds that. After 20 years, the summation of me is he pisses people off. Um, <laughs> no, I love being provocative. Why, why are we here otherwise if we're not trying to add to the discourse or at least help define it? Um, and sometimes you have to provoke and stimulate a reaction. Well, you won't get it. You know, the proudest yep. I am of spin it's not that it was a great magazine, which I'm very happy about, I mean, music magazine, which I'm very happy about. It did fantastic music reporting, the best of its kind in its time, um, equal to Rolling Stone at its best. We um, had an AIDS column. And for 10 years, we broke ground, research ground. When reporting. nobody else would dare touch the subject. Nobody would. Even after we started, nobody would. But they just didn't. They said, oh, well, you know, we can't talk about death and, and homosexuality and you know, we were the first people to say it isn't going to be a heterosexual epidemic. 
It was just all the evidence, and we got all the evidence from the government said that wasn't happening, and didn't happen. Partly, at least, a lifestyle thing, and the the kind of um, drugs that were involved in a lot of that bathhouse scene in the seventies and eighties was a lifestyle yep. that was destructive. And we were honest about everything. We were not politically correct. But I'm going to tell you, Jim, ten years, 120 articles. When I sold the magazine, they stopped it. The next issue, it happened to be, the, it would have been the beginning of the eleventh year. Um, in all that time, we never had to print a retraction or a correction. That's how Amazing. scrupulous our reporting was. How worked. serious you took to journalism. Yeah, absolutely. I line edited every word in 10 years. And that, mm. and that I did not do that on anything else in the magazine. I never missed editing that column because I wanted to make sure we were always correct because we were talking about life and death. We were literally guiding people. Many years after I sold the magazine, people would still stop me on the street and say, thanks to you, I'm alive because I got off AZT because of your articles, or I followed this course, or I looked into that, or I spoke to this doctor, I discovered actually, even though I had tested positive HIV, I didn't have HIV, because the false positives thing was a massive phenomenon that we exposed. Yes, it was. And, you know, we, um, we literally changed the way the world did finally come around to reporting about AIDS, because we broke so many stories that the big newspapers of the world, starting with the London Sunday Times, funny enough, just started stealing our stuff. And my reporter would come in and say, look, 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 they stole my article. I said, you know what? This is one time we're going to let them because it's that important. If it just gets yep. information out there and if Sunday time can do a better job than we can, which it can, of getting this spread, let's, let's let them have it. You know? And I eventually had dinner with the guy who was stealing all my stuff, our stuff, uh, a guy called Brian Deere, I think his name was. And we had lunch in New York, dinner in New York. And I said, you know, you know, I knew about all this and I just let you do it. <laughs> He goes, well, I kind of wondered after a while why you weren't suing this. <laughs> so there you go. There's a oh. fantastic conge- collegiality amongst journalists, even, even rogues. Um, but no, the relationship with my father was very good. Uh, famously, we were estranged for 18 years, which was very sad. But um, part of life, and we did reconcile, and I was with him when he died, and very, very, very close to him for the last several years of his life. Um, He said to me once, we were having dinner in LA, and he said, all that time wasted. And I said, yes, but we're here now. And that was the only time we ever discussed it. You know. Is that right? Yeah. And was there was there a reconciliation or you just Oh yeah. No, no. There was a fantastic reconciliation uh that um lasted for six years and he did pass away uh in 2010. But it was what broke the ice. I want to say this too. I never didn't love him for 18 years not talking to him. I never once had a day where I didn't love him. And I believe the same is true of him. But we, we banged heads. Couldn't yeah. be that you were alike in any way. <laughs> we, we, we were, we were. And I'm proud to say <laughs> that, to be honest, very proud. Yes. But I got from him this one great notion that you have to be brave if you believe in something. And he did very brave journalism and was attacked for it and hounded and I think eventually ruined by, by forces that he had upset especially the US government. Um, and, but he, he had a great bravery. And I thought, well, that's important. I took that to me. And I, I've had my moments of great attack from the outside world because of something I've said or believed in or, or published. And I've remembered, no, be brave. You've got to stick with it if you think it's true. And if you don't think it's true, you find you're wrong, you admit it immediately. But the, the big the big instances in my own life, I've, I've not been wrong and I have stuck to and I've defended and held my ground and been vindicated finally. Well, uh, I, I, I love your story, Bob. I think you're a remarkable guy. I'm, I'm so pleased that I'm getting to know you. Well, and thank you. Uh, relationships are important in my life too. And, and like you, even at this broken down old age, new relationships are important and, uh, and learning new people, whether you agree with them or not, especially if you don't, learning different points of view is what it's all about and how lucky are we yeah. uh, that we get yeah. to do the kinds of things we do uh, get to spend time with the people we want to spend time with and for me to make a new relationship like we're developing bob it's extremely important to me and i'm extremely grateful for you to share your time and your wisdom with us today oh thank you and uh, the same right back at you glad to begin yep. to know you really enjoyed this right. can't wait to see you at that ethiopian restaurant on yeah the, uh, we got to do it interview. let's do it it's <laughs> extraordinary <laughs> We'll do it. All right, great. Love it. Take care. Thanks a lot, man. Speak to you soon.